It is our privilege to welcome all of you to this exciting webinar along with our partners Cubisys. Today's topic is around DevOps and delivering value at lightning speed. Uh, my name is Sairam Vedam. I'm responsible for uh, the global marketing initiatives at Signity and uh, initiating all our thought leadership initiatives. So before I introduce the eminent panel, uh, let me also set a, a small context. Um, in the age of uh, digital world today, when uh, software is almost getting delivered at an average of 11 seconds, it is very important for ensuring the quality of software is getting delivered without hampering with the speed at which it is being produced. There is no better way than to learn from the pioneers in DevOps world and then understand how is it actually being made. With that as the background, I have uh, a esteemed speaker from Cubisys today uh, who's also our partner. Um, and then I also have uh, the thought leader from Signity as the other speaker. Um, so going forward, um, what we understand is you just cannot compromise on the quality of the software, no matter how many iterations and how agile the development is getting happened. It is so very tightly integrated in the world of DevOps that it is just has to be done very, very seamlessly, extremely continuously and highly integrated with the entire development operations, which is what the slide here that's from the Forrester is talking about. Without delaying any further, I would like to introduce Saumin Chaudhary. Saumin leads the Cubisys Alliances and Channel team, comes with vast experience of more than two decades in transformational technologies from virtualization to cloud and big data. Prior to Cubisys, Saumin was with VMware and currently he brings in a lot of strategic and data-driven approach to enable customers achieving their business agility objectives. At Cubisys, he is responsible for all the innovation, comes with a BS in operations research from Cornell and an MBA from Stern University. I believe we would not require a, a very better speaker than Saumin talking about the innovation in the DevOps era. Having said that, it's also my pleasure to introduce Prasanna. Prasanna is the Vice President for Enterprise Solutions Group at Signity, driving in these initiatives in the North American division of our Enterprise Sales Group. Is also responsible for driving in all the custom solutions for modern enterprises, particularly focusing a lot around the Agile and DevOps initiatives. He's responsible for solution evangelization and service delivery, focuses a lot of uh, solution delivery around quality engineering across the life cycle, specializes in areas of DevOps service virtualization, holds a master's in South Southern <coughs> master's from the Southern Methodist University in Dallas and a bachelor's degree in engineering from India. Having um, welcome everyone to the webinar and I leave it to Saumin to take it forward. Thanks Saumin for joining on behalf of Cubisys and thanks Prasanna. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very excited to be here and uh, to speak about a topic that's uh, very near and dear to Cubis's heart and uh, we and we think to many of our uh, customers as well as those out in the industry. So before I get started on the DevOps, I just wanted to take 20 seconds to talk a little bit about uh, the industry trends that got us here. So I think uh, uh, those of us that have been around for a while, we all know how uh, we want what how we've uh, kind of migrated from waterfall to some sort of implementation of agile development methodology or a mix uh, that has been uh, very transformational in terms of what it means to do deliver continuous del delivery and so along that way we also saw the infrastructure organizations change as well right so we saw virtualization come on very strong in the mid 2000s uh, that of course led to the solution providers uh, in the cloud space, uh, all three types, the IIS, PaaS, and SaaS. And of course, most recently, we're seeing the advent of containers to provide uh, innovation in, in more of an atomic structure with uh, emphasis on security. So with all of these evolutions in computing and technology, uh, we're seeing this, uh, what has always been a requirement, this greater uptime availability, but the focus has shifted, I think, in, in the right direction in terms of more from an infrastructure to the application basis. And what all this means also is that uh, with the advent of cloud and the SaaS providers, we're seeing that uh, releases no longer have to be done on an annual basis. In fact, we see them being done on a monthly, weekly basis in some cases. So that's actually permeating through to the enterprise space. And I'm sure many of you are looking at 
all these different uh, releases that are coming on a monthly basis and, and how do you prioritize them uh, to make sure you get the biggest benefit. But when you take a look at all of these changes that ha have happened from a technology pace, the question remains, what are we talking about in terms of accuracy? Right? We're talking about speed, we're talking about elasticity, but the accuracy component has been kind of left out. Uh, and the way I think the industry has been resolving it has been the traditional way in terms of deploying processes and automating the deployment of templates. Uh, so you're still kind of left with this legacy means, method, and process of, of uh, attacking uh, the real world problems that we have in this much more dynamic space. Next, please. So, so when we're talking about this change, you know, we, we've seen this migration to Agile, and uh, it's important that we understand and distinguish between what Agile development does as opposed to DevOps. So, uh, if you take a look at Agile software development, it's really all about encouraging cross-functional collaboration and it's between the analysis, design, development, and QA functions, right? So we're talking about the business analysts uh, being engaged with the developers in QA. But it left out a very important stakeholder in making all of this happen, and that was the operation side. So uh, if you take a look at what was still happening is that operations and change management teams were still left resolving deployment issues in the legacy model. Uh, you get the changes, you have to create these UAT environments, but then at the, at the last part, just before you go live, this is kind of tossed over the wall. And uh, that obviously can impose some significant challenges, especially for business critical systems like ERP systems and CRM systems where go lives are very stressful and uh, the post go live period can uh, you know, last several weeks or several months. So therefore, it was you know, clearly understood that we need to somehow incorporate this very important stakeholder. And so DevOps is starting to really gain steam in the last several years. And at Cubasys, we noticed this uh, several years back. And actually, in about 2013 timeframe, we were actually awarded uh, a cool vendor in DevOps via uh, Gartner. And what we saw was that this notion of throwing it over the wall, we needed to make sure that both the de development and the operations team were clearly aligned. And by that, we wanted to make sure that the uh, operations team was involved earlier and also that the development team and the QA team uh, also knew what was available to them in terms of production uh, issues so that they could develop and build code better. So it was meant to it basically allow to have both sides to have skin in the game. Next slide, please. So what's going on when we talk about DevOps? Well, why the heck do we have it, right? So it's not just a matter of, I, you know, it's good for IT, but it's really about increasing the business benefits. So there's obviously lots of transaction costs associated when you're talking about delivering change. And how do I make, how do I, more importantly, make sure the right change gets out first and foremost? So this is exactly what DevOps is meant to address because we all know that not all features are used all at the same time. So creating and delivering these releases is, is significantly important, and it's and doing this in the most in the least technical disruptive manner. So that's really why we're doing this. It's it, then if you take a look at it from a goal perspective, the what around DevOps, it's really about that clarity and consistency. And of course, we know who's involved, and the methodology and how it's done is kind of a moving target. Right now, there are different methodologies and tools that are continuing to evolve. And we think that this is a great opportunity for customers to learn how to do this in a, in a, in a, in a much uh, better way to enable continuous integration and delivery. Next slide, please. So this is all about people, process, and tools. And what we want to ensure is that, as you can see, that there's self-service along with governance. We think that many of the issues that, that apply post-deployment are often governance related, not just a matter of is issues related to code. So we want to address that in, in this phase. Uh, also during the process, we want to make sure that if you're going to do self-service, that you have that on-demand capability. And of course, critical to all of this is improved testing because continuous integration and delivery means that you have to make sure that and ensure that 
that everything is working properly along the way to before it gets deployed and uh, obviously once it's deployed. And of course the tools, we talked about the automation, we need to ensure that the automation is done in such a non-intrusive manner that there is self-service, you're not worrying about APIs and things of the other things that can slow you down. So that's the approach Cubasys takes to DevOps. Uh, next slide please. So one of the fundamental questions that we get is, well, you know, I already have in-house virtual environments, so why, what's so different about leveraging other technologies to do this? Uh, and uh, it's very simple. If you're talking about enabling change at, uh, you know, as, as a number that was quoted in terms of uh, how frequently uh, releases are being delivered, it's no longer that uh, annual or quarterly basis. You're talking about doing it on a monthly or weekly basis. And if you're talking about leveraging in-house virtual environments, I think most of us know that it takes anywhere from seven, seven days to almost a month. So let's just say 14 days just to be uh, on the safe side uh, for most organizations. And the reason it takes all that time is you have all these different constituents that are involved. You've got the different sysadmins, uh, both from the network, the, uh, the application, uh, servers, so on, who have to do their work to provision a VM. Uh, and of course an environment is more than just a VM. So therefore, you have to load multiple templates, copy the data, customize it. If you're putting it out on your network, you have to make sure that all the IP addresses and the URLs don't necessarily conflict. So doing that in a safe manner and getting that available can take, let's say, 14 days. And if you wanted, if you wanted to release code every, every month, you're going to spend half your time waiting. So a better option that many customers have adopted, obviously, is looking at the at the uh, cloud providers and sort of in terms of IAS and PaaS. But even then, it takes anywhere from three to seven days. So if, again, the notion of having more rapid cycle time is not necessarily fully addressed. Sure, you get the ability to provision resources and you get the elasticity, but you're not getting the accuracy because you're still having to customize all of this and having to migrate the data and, and do all of those steps that you would have had to have done in your in-house virtual environment. So we've come up with a with an improved way to enable you to do this continuous delivery and integration. And with the Cubasys platform, which we'll speak about, it's really about leveraging your production environment as your template for innovation. So we allow you to capture your environment in minutes and hours and then provision those environments on demand. And once, once these environments have been captured, you can provision multiple environments, isolated, standalone, uh, all secure in, in less than a day. So let's uh, go to the next slide, please. So what is the Cubasys environment? Well, it's a, it's a hardware and software platform that creates these on-demand test environments for Windows-based applications. And as I mentioned earlier, each environment is isolated, available within hours, and it's about as close to production as possible. And what's nice about this is that you no longer have to worry about the accuracy part. You're getting the speed of virtualization and private cloud, and you're able to do that without having to maintain or worry about templates drifting apart. So that also means from an operation side, they're actually removed from taking care of a lot of these mundane tasks that nobody really likes to do, which is create a template, maintain them, and then recreate environments. Because that's not necessarily fun for anyone, uh, either doing the work or waiting for that environment. And of course, from an ease of use perspective, the self-service is very critical. What we do is we ensure that you don't have to worry about learning yet another set of APIs so that you can have business analysts as well as uh, the seasoned developer create these environments as needed uh, in an automated manner. And what's nice about this capability also is that if you take a look at this, the bigger square that we have over here, which has two environments, uh, the Microsoft SharePoint and this dynamic server environment as, as well as the users that would connect, we can have these private clouds created where it's just either one environment where you're involved, you care about the SharePoint environment or you care about the ERP environment in the case of Dynamics, or you could have the entire environment where it's both, both pieces of code, both applications running at the same time. So, and of course you can have multiple instances of these because you'll often have multiple QA testers or even UAT acts requiring access to the same environment, but you don't want what one, one user does 
to impact the others. So if your QA team, someone's working on the SharePoint piece, another one's working on the ERP piece, uh, you want them to be able to do that without uh, stepping on each other. So this allows you to, this really allows you to enable, do that. So how does Cubasys work? Next slide, please. Is if you're type, if you're talking about your development teams and, and production, is that the first thing that we'd have to do is discover the environment. And, and we're doing this without the use of different agents or without uh, installing any other tools. We're just going to use uh, code that already exists in your environment. We do uh, LDAP and WMI queries to gather the, the catalog of all the servers that would be involved in deploying an application. Once we've defined that and we've discovered and defined them, then we go ahead and do the capture process using uh, very standard tools like VSS. So once the capture occurs, we go ahead and replicate that onto the Cubasys environment, the Cubasys platform, I should say, and and now the service catalog gets created, one containing the servers and the other containing, and the superset containing the application with all the different servers defined. Once those, Once you have that service catalog, the different users can go ahead and check out or create and provision one of these environments on demand. And as I mentioned, they're all going to be secure and isolated. They could be the same application or they could be different applications or a combination. And once the testing gets performed, the ability to now push that code out to your code repository so that from a change management perspective, there's no process change, if you will, to how you release code so that now once it's been validated, you can go ahead and push the code out to production. So what's great about this is that you can use it for a variety of things, both from the prototyping aspect, as you can imagine, and then also in terms of creating the runbooks that you need. So if you have validated systems, you have governance issues, you can go ahead and uh, create your runbooks. And then we also mentioned about, because we're going to go ahead and capture the domain controllers and Active Directory, and, and so you can also enforce and actually validate that your governance is, uh, all your governance policies are being enforced. So uh, this really does provide a very comprehensive system and the ability to do this, uh, once you've captured these environments, to spin up environments in a matter of 15, 20 minutes is really powerful to allow you to meet those cycle time objectives that you have to release code quickly, effectively, and with accuracy. Uh, with that, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, you for allowing me to speak with all of you. I'm going to turn this back to Prasanna, sir. All right, thanks, Herman. And uh, so, before I uh, before I jump on why Forrester cited us, uh, I think one thing important to mention is uh, is the way Signity works, right? So, Signity is an independent testing services company. So, all we do is around the quality assurance and quality engineering space. And uh, we were the pioneers when uh, when we started doing DevOps assessments and. Uh, reviewing DevOps readiness for organizations. And while we did that, uh, we were recognized by, by several of the industry analysts, and Forrester is one of them where, where we uh, were mentioned in a report that spoke about what is the importance of, uh, of automation in this, whole, in this whole thing, right? So if we get to the next slide, uh, what you will see is that in a typical application lifecycle, as we go through this whole process, uh, the ideation, to, to go live is typically, let's say, a seven-month window during which everything happens. Uh, one major thing that keeps getting mentioned to us from, let's say, the development teams or the test teams is the wait times. So that is one major factor that impacts uh, the, the release cycles and the release plans that enterprise has, right? And uh, the other thing is getting to the feedback that the customers give after you go live. So combining both of those or combining all of those into into one ecosystem, the dev, the test, the ops, the, the production side, and looking at the feedback from there and making a completed loop uh, back into the ideation and prototyping for the subsequent releases is, uh, is essentially what DevOps will come down to. And the ability to give organizations to deliver continuously, uh, eliminating the wait times, eliminating several other factors within the overall life cycle is something that, uh, that we've helped customers with as well. So if we get to the next slide, please. So uh, we call it uh, the nirvana in quality engineering. So that is a term that Signity is going to bend. But what it is is uh, an enterprise wants to make sure that they deliver continuously, deliver software continuously. And to be able to do that, uh, the, the core essence is in the life cycle 
uh, continuously planning, continuously developing, most importantly, testing continuously and releasing and deploying continuously. So this is the traditional way. And the other element that gets added into this whole mixture is getting feedback from your production side, from your customers, the end users, or whatever not, and feeding those into the into the cycles much earlier than being in a reactive mode, having a more proactive approach to that. So how do we get there? How do we actually get to a point where we're able to uh, develop continuously, develop and test continuously, and have that whole ecosystem set up? So a collaborative development approach is a, is a right start, and having your testing teams or the quality engineering teams involved much earlier in the life cycle. And then the release and deployment responsibilities, which typically are the ops team, uh, bringing them into the mix and making this all one large ecosystem, right? So that is the essential focus. And, uh, and I think when I say collaborative development and continuous testing, what it is is right at the unit testing phase, or even before that, uh, QA teams have a large role to play. So that is your traditional shift left, where you get into the requirements phase, you start analyzing requirements, you start looking at various factors that can help you identify the problems or the defects or bugs, whatever you call them, much earlier in the life cycle, in an agile manner, of course, right? So having all of that as a quality assurance responsibility was the tradition, but today we're talking about a dual shift. We're talking about a shift left and a shift right. So the shift right factor comes in here where you get your uh, feedback continually from the other end and uh, feed that intelligence back. And your QA teams or the QE teams, quality engineering teams, are responsible to work in a, in a much more uh, collaborative fashion with the development teams. Uh, they start building out your, let's say, automated unit tests or things of that nature to get started, to give them a jump start and help them get to a continuous integration phase, right? <coughs> so to be able to do that, uh, the automated unit testing, the code coverage, the statement level, branch level, all kinds of uh, fun stuff during the development phase can be something that the quality engineering team owns. And then the environments are something that you start automating with a tool like Cubasys or otherwise and taking those uh, taking those environments to use to be tested in silos, right? So that is one thing that can start much earlier. And the other thing is from a deployment automation standpoint, one of the biggest challenges will be to have uh, to have all of these environments stood up in no time and then deploying the software to it and ensuring that it is ready to be uh, moved to the next stage, which is typically the prod. One thing I'd like to add here is that the code analysis, the performance engineering, security engineering, all of these factors have to be brought in much earlier as well. So when I say performance engineering, it's not a thing that, or an activity that you perform when you have or when you move your code into pre-production. So the way that uh, that we have helped customers is that building smaller uh, unit level performance testing where you optimize your stored procs, where you optimize your SQL queries, those sorts of things to ensure that all those will not come back and bite you later in the, in the cycle, right? So eliminating all of these uh, and in, involving the engineering teams from a quality standpoint much earlier in the life cycle can help you get to one and two much more efficiently and much more higher quality of code than you would normally be able to do. Right. If you do one more click, uh, please. So, and then all of this is great. You get into uh, pre-prod, you find the application works great. You have automated tests, you've measured everything and you're happy and you go live. If you're not able to respond to the feedback that you're getting from the production side uh, in a much more efficient way and be more reactive to changes, then your ability to come up and deploy the next release might be impacted. So to that essence, uh, what we do is that we set up monitoring on the production side. So the continuous feedback loop is established back into the ideation phase of the life cycle. So the planning can be much more significant, much more quicker in terms of the way things are uh, established from that perspective as well. And the other thing that I'd like to mention here is that synthetic monitoring and performance monitoring on the application side is only one side of it, but having a, a more uh, you know, proactive approach to identifying those issues as defects or otherwise and taking that and improving on usability experience, things of that nature as well will, uh, will accelerate the overall cycle. So this to us is, uh, is, is quality engineering in a sense and continuous delivery and DevOps, right? So all of these become uh, or help uh, organizations become 
uh, looking at uh, testing as not just an activity that happens towards the end of the life cycle, but more of a responsibility, which is quality, right? So ensuring that across the life cycle, while delivering continuously at the rapid speed that you aspire to is, uh, is the essence of how you would get to this. Next slide, please. So how do we how do you how do you do DevOps? Is that a tool that you can simply implement? Is that something that you can simply uh, go turn on the lights and say, okay, from today I'll do DevOps? Actually, no. I mean, it's it's uh, more significant than that. So there's three major things that we've identified as uh, as playing critical role in your organization's transformation into DevOps. So first thing, obviously, is a culture. It's a mindset thing, and uh, the collaboration across the various teams, across the various stakeholders, if they can all be brought into one ecosystem and you can make it work like one big happy family, that is the first step to achieving that. And the second thing is being more agile and being more automated in the way you develop your applications. When I say more automated, I really mean at the unit level, at the integration testing level and things of that nature. Having those in control and having those in an automated fashion will help a great deal and eliminating wait times, right? One of the biggest uh, challenges is inavailability of the services when you want to actually test something or uh, depending on stubs that you have written sometimes uh, impacts your ability to produce better quality code. So having service virtualization or building smart stubs or mockups that can actually respond to you and have your integration tests more uh, efficiently conducted and uh, in an automated fashion, that will help you a great deal in accelerating your dev cycles. And uh, test-driven development is one side of it, but you, if you actually look at it, it becomes a larger ecosystem than, than having that. You have your uh, pair programming, traditionally is two developers, but if you can have a quality engineer or a software developer in test role involved in your development cycles and have pair programming and test-driven development in that fashion, that will be much more effective and that will be a much more targeted way of getting higher quality code. And uh, like I said, performance engineering and security analysis, security engineering, much earlier in the life cycle, makes a big difference when it comes to accelerating your dev cycles and getting into that phase where you have your builds automated, you have your continuous integration set up, and then gives you the ability to drive the operations team and infrastructure teams uh, with tools like, empower them with tools like, let's say, Cubasys to, to essentially automate and De deploy those environments on the fly so that you can deploy your code to those environments and run your automation tests and automation frameworks into that. So all of this uh, together will help you in that transformation journey to, uh, to DevOps. And uh, uh, the other last thing that I'd like to mention is that it's not a, it's not going to be or it cannot be like a like a, a responsibility struggle or a power struggle, right? It, it's got to be a, a responsibility across and then the distributed responsibility and show up governance that will help you get to that point eventually. Next slide, please. So from a business view perspective, if I had to lay out all the, all the different phases and all the different things that have to be done, so one thing you will see is that from the production side, it's not only about getting your, uh, your monitoring information or your performance information, but you're actually gathering analytics from a usability standpoint. You can, uh, you're doing your usability experience management. You're doing your testing and production, which could be synthesizers that you deploy on that side. That is one big factor that we've done. And uh, from a big data perspective, analyzing those and generating those reports and taking all of that information back into your business planning and aggregation phase. So that is kind of how uh, the whole ecosystem works. And, Signity has a framework that I will show you in the next slide, but before I get there, there's several things that can help you uh, in this whole journey. So some of the examples are Signity smart tools that we have developed that can help you accelerate the key events in the software test lifecycle, continuous integration frameworks from an automation standpoint, that'll help you a great deal, and then ensuring that you're preparing yourself from an automated deployment and all of that using various tools, right? So. Uh, having all of that established and having all of that uh, driven top down from the business side. Uh, the business might always say that I need something delivered yesterday, right? But it comes down to then driving and giving the empowerment to the individual technical teams and the QA teams alike and making sure that all of these things come together and uh, you have that feedback, feedback loop established and empowering with the right tool set. Uh, it'll make it much more easier to get to DevOps than you would think. 
Next slide, please. So from a uh, from more detailed framework perspective, one thing you will notice is here uh, you have all the stakeholders, all the players spread across the life cycle. So if we start at the top left there, you will see that the business strategy, the, ideate, the ideation of the projects and the portfolio management, uh, an application is not really one application, right? It, it interacts and interfaces with 25 other things on the back end. So there's going to be an end-to-end -end process vision, and there's going to be different teams that are doing different things. There's, there could be third-party integrations. There could be uh, different layers or different tiers of applications that are being uh, controlled, monitored, managed, and integrated into your overall uh, one large application that you think, typically a dot-com kind of application or a mobile application on the front end that the customers see. So to make that a continuous release or a continuous delivery, uh, put it in a continuous delivery mode, uh, like I said, it has to start early. So the dev test, unit test, the service level testing, the integration, all of this has to be automated from that perspective. And then when you have your integration uh, between other business units, other application teams that are developing integration points into your own application, the key thing is to make sure that you employ techniques uh, like service virtualization. Right. From when I say service virtualization, it doesn't really have to be uh, a tool or something that that deploys virtual services across the board for you. But it can be something starting with something as simple as a smart stuff. So don't have uh, a, a single response or a single request response sequence built as a stub, but make it more dynamic, make it more effective in a way that. Uh, you have more real user-like or real-time experience when it comes to the virtualized service or the virtualized element. And you can use several tools from the market, obviously, but then making sure that you get all of that together and package it in such a way that your end-to-end -end test, your bottom two boxes on the left, will give you your end-to-end -end testing, and that is established through automation. So you have your unit tests, you have your services, you have your uh, UI, and uh, all of these elements automated from an end-to-end -end business process testing standpoint even before you get into your pre-prod. So that should be the goal and uh, including performance engineering. So one thing I usually suggest my customers is that setting up like a 20 user test using let's say JMeter or even LoadRunner, whichever tool they're more comfortable with, setting that up within your cycles, within your dev environments and the QA environments and making sure that a lot of optimization from a code perspective is happening there. And the other thing that I would uh, I would suggest strongly is to ensure that you have your test coverage matrices established, uh, both from a requirement standpoint and from a code standpoint. So it's ensuring that you have a requirements traceability, requirements coverage from that perspective, uh, from a testing strategy perspective, and then ensuring that you have your uh, statement coverage, your branch coverage, your code coverage, tools established in an automated fashion to make sure that you get, you're getting the true coverage from an end-to-end -end standpoint established even before uh, you have your test cycles completed. And once uh, the, the build is ready, continuous integration enabled, and it gets deployed into higher environments, uh, the key thing there is to, is to have a tool like Cubuses that can help you generate those uh, deployments automatically. And the other factor that you have to, cons have to consider, to consider, then consider that could be the UI or end-to-end -end process tests that you run on those environments and validate the builds, validate and ensure that you have everything covered from that standpoint and move it into your pre-prod environments that you probably have established already. So if there is, let's say, a gap in some of the testing or you found a major defect that you didn't think about much earlier, then you can have your uh, multiple environments available to you to test from that perspective uh, rather than testing in one final pre-prod kind of environment. And then you set up your synthesizers, you set up your production, uh, testing and production synthesizers and all of those, starting with your pre-prod. You monitor, you start looking at pre-prod as, as your prod essentially to conduct a lot of that testing and then get into release mode. And in release or prior to the release, what we recommend is having an ORP operation readiness testing that has to happen. And your user acceptance, which was conducted in your pre-prod is probably a, a subset of the overall scenarios that were given to you as a requirement. And uh, having those run in, uh, in production as well will, will help you overcome all of your release nightmares. So release is typically looked at as a, a, a ton of my friends and colleagues uh, typically say that I have a release for the next three weeks, don't, don't bother me, right? So that can shrink, that whole cycle can shrink much, 
uh, much to a much smaller phase. And uh, for some of our customers, what we've done is by establishing all of these processes uh, and uh, setting up these uh, templates and the methodologies and the frameworks, what we were able to do is to shrink the test cycles, uh, which typically were towards the end of a, end of a uh, development cycle. We were able to shrink that down into a three-day window where they would do all of their end-to-end -end testing on pre-prod instead of, instead of having that completely you know, siloed at the end. Right. So that is another thing that we uh, that this framework can help you get to. Next slide, please. So if you if you wonder how the architecture would look like, right? So one, two, three through seven, right? So if you really look at it, three things will play a major role here. So the developer com community, uh, it could be SVN or any of the uh, repositories that you guys use that will be shared between the developers and the testers uh, and uh, once you get to uh, let's say your code is ready you have everything set up and Jenkins is one of the most popular continuous integration tools that we have seen and that is something that you can use to uh, run all of your unit testing along with some of the UI level testing that the QEs have written already and then you move it into, into the next level for an automation, automated source code compilation and things of that sort. And then you move into your environment automation, which I was talking about earlier, where you would have with some of the Kibisys modules to deploy those environments on the fly and to make sure that you run your tests. Uh, the framework that I showed you earlier has plugins into Kibisys uh, to deploy those environments and then trigger the automated scripts that were developed for those specific uh, environments. And that is finally, uh, integrated into your overall build and, and deploy to the next higher environment. So all of these together play a major role. Uh, if you, I mean, like you can make out from the screen, right? Jenkins plays a key thing. And when I say Jenkins, it's really the continuous integration that will play a key role in making all of this happen from up to the build standpoint and to get to that next uh, next thing to have environments readily available. Cubus's modules have helped us a great deal to integrate into our framework and make sure that that, that works out just fine as well. Next slide, please. So where do I start the journey? This is one thing that uh, people ask us and we help a lot of our customers with uh, with doing DevOps readiness assessments and making sure that they, what to expect, right? So what to look for and what to expect when we start the DevOps journey. And uh, and I think one of the things that comes down to is if, if you're get to, getting to an application or if you're choosing an application that is close to end of life or if there's not too many changes, it's a very stable application, there's not changes requested or it's just something that you're keeping the lights on, that's the bad choice, right? It's uh, important to pick an application that's very dynamic and very agile in the way that you're developing it, in the way you're deploying it, and uh, <laughs> in the way that it is being in, uh, impacting or touching your customers. I think that will be a good thing to start with. And uh, one other thing I do not recommend is big, uh, picking a business critical application, right? Make sure that you pick something that, that has uh, that has the dynamism and the agility, but is not necessarily mission or business critical for you. And uh, having or making sure that you have all of the best practices, uh, the community or the ecosystem that you have set up, making sure that all of that comes together and the intelligence and the uh, talent is available within your teams, right? To set up those unit tests, to automate these unit tests, to set up the continuous integration, to set up your deployment automation, all of those things are something that you have. And last but not the least thing, I mean, make sure that you select the right tool. And uh, the tool selection can vary depending on your application and technology stack, but that is something that uh, uh, most of the commercial tools or the open source tools both support. So ensuring that you pick that right choice of tools is another thing that you have to consider before starting that journey. Next slide, please. So before I wrap up here, I think uh, the best practices, right? So one thing I'd like uh, for you to uh, understand is that Collaboration is the key thing. So when I say culture, it is uh, it is something that has to be, uh, like I said earlier as well, quality is a responsibility and testing is not an activity. And the ops team, the dev team, and the QA team have to live in one large ecosystem. And it's not a methodology or one single framework that I can set up and say, okay, I've turned this on, so everything is going to be fine. It cannot work that way. So I have to, uh, you have to break down the silos, you have to break down the 
the cultures that exist between the various teams, the infrastructure teams typically hate the dev, the dev teams hate the QA, whatever not, right? So making sure that all of them work together uh, to make this a reality is something that you have to start with. And then automation. You cannot ignore the fact that all of this is only possible through automation from an end-to-end -end perspective and at various stages as well. So having end-to-end -end automation is one side of the story, but making sure that you have all of your individual elements automated, uh, employing virtualization and service virtualization or uh, any kind of uh, smart stubbing involved right at the unit phase is something that you have to consider and make sure that is available. And uh, making sure that you're running lean, right? I mean, you cannot have, uh, you cannot have a lot of waste, uh, uh, which is, again, goes back to my point about wait times. So that is one thing that you have to ensure that you eliminate completely. And measurement of everything across the board, right? So making sure that you have your uh, governance processes and governance policies established very thoroughly from a metrics and measurement standpoint. So you have to look for the metrics for from release to release, even within a release, what are my trends, how, how is everything working out, what are the defects that I've, I found in dev versus QA versus pre-prod, all of those things are some things that you have to garner, capture, and measure continuously. So it doesn't stop with uh, continuous development and continuous testing, it actually stretches into continuous measurement in an effort to make sure that you have continuous improvement methodology set up as well. And all of these things, they have to work together and sharing is the key thing, right? I mean, the dev and uh, the QA and the ops teams, all of them work together, uh, share the repositories, share the knowledge, and uh, the application knowledge is not distributed across. The business users, they drive their vision down and uh, everyone else works in one, uh, one big happy family mode, essentially. So all of these things, if they come together, is, uh, is something that will make your DevOps implementation and your DevOps journey much more easier than you would think. Next slide, please. So I did put in uh, a case study of how we delivered continuous delivery or continuous uh, uh, deployments for a customer of ours. So the business need was fairly simple, uh, pretty standard actually if you, if you think about it. They wanted faster release cycles, they wanted to release every week or every two weeks if possible, and they wanted an application that is reliable. And uh, the architects or the the technical team, they came down to two things. I mean, it's a very heterogeneous environment. There's a lot of things that are moving parts. Uh, different application teams that work on different release cycles. They do not align sometimes. And there's not enough automation for us to be able to do anything with this. And uh, the QA team's biggest challenge was they had to wait for a long time to get any of the builds or anything to begin their testing. So that was another challenge. So we, uh, the, the solution framework that we put in together was uh, continuous delivery and adopting all the DevOps principles is where we started. It is a quality engineering approach that really helped us get to the bottom of it. Uh, there were two pieces to the application stack. Uh, it was, one was a dot-com piece and the other one was a mobile app and uh, both were as important to them as anything else. So the several tools that we had used, several, a combination of tools to get down to get down to setting up this whole thing. And then when we build the framework that we saw earlier, uh, that uh, when we build the framework, that's exactly how it looked like. And a lot of functional testing and non-functional testing was started even before the builds got deployed. So that is uh, the biggest benefit. And uh, this is the customer I was referring to where I said the three week or four week test cycle, we shrunk it down to three days, literally. And uh, with 100% test coverage and 100% traceability across the board. So there was a, a large team engaged, obviously, and then uh, dual shore uh, was another thing that helped as well. Uh, even though it was an agile uh, delivery model, uh, geographically distributed agile principles were implemented to make sure that we, we got down to the bottom of it and we have, uh, we have achieved continuous delivery. Uh, and now they have like a two week release cycle for their web and a weekly release cycle for their mobile app. And uh, to the next slide, please. So the way we started was that the quality engineering framework was set up and a lot of testing was uh, was manual. And uh, 
uh, we had to build automation into the whole overall picture to make sure that we were able to drive the cost lower while gaining more agility in the way we were delivering the, the software. And then the integrated framework from a, uh, from a GUI and non-GUI perspective, from a service virtualization and service automation uh, perspective, those things were adapted. And the automation scripts, uh, we make, made sure that the combination, combinatorial execution uh, for both the dot com piece and the, and the mobile app You run multiple device combinations, browser combinations, platform combinations, and uh, and at at one point we even got to like 100% automation coverage, which was the goal. And the continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment is something that we were able to achieve about four or five months down into the engagement. And uh, the basis of that was to uh, start the unit test automation, build the uh, Build, build automation, and then the continuous integration cycles and setting that whole thing up. And uh, the next level really came when we took quality engineering across the board and we employed various techniques like service virtualization to make sure that we got end-to-end -end process, business process testing completed. And uh, we deployed production synthesizers, testing and production, and social testing as means to, means to drive a number of these elements towards the DevOps model. We're still working on uh, the other practices, the future releases, but uh, right now where we stand today, I think we're in a very comfortable uh, position in terms of being able to deploy continuously. Next slide, please. And in summary, some of the techniques and best practices uh, need us to say uh, defect detection has to be early. Early defect detection can come with your shift left practices and being able to identify most of your defects, let's say in the unit or much earlier than that phases. And uh, automation is something that you have to adopt and implement across the board. Make sure that you have your continuous integration framework and uh, you're not limited by the environments. You're limited by these, uh, the velocity at which you can produce code. The environment automation is something that you can employ for that as well. And making sure that uh, your readiness checklist and your build verification testing, which is your smoke test, is completely automated. And your non-functional parameters are some things that are coming much earlier in the life cycle. And you're doing your unit level performance engineering kind of testing and security engineering from a code analysis standpoint much earlier in the life cycle. And ensure that you are tracking your SLAs, your KPIs, and a number of different things from a release readiness standpoint and uh, be more proactive in the way you approach it, and collaboration is what will get you down that stream. 